Hi, I'm Matt. I'm the product expert for Affinity Designer. And today I'm going to show you some of the new features which we've included in version two of Designer. And we've worked really hard to get a huge amount of new powerful features into version two of the apps. So I'm going to get stuck in straight away and start by showing you the new Shape Builder tool. Just before I talk you through this first feature though, it's worth highlighting some of the improvements we've made to the UI and workspace overall. The tool icons and many of the panels have been completely redesigned and we've made some particularly big improvements to our layers panel, which as you might notice straight away, is very different in V2. Groups and other nested layers are much easier to navigate and we now have these handy layer icons so you can work out what your layer type is just at a glance. It's also much easier to clip and mask your layers via the layers panel now as the drop areas have been improved greatly. So it's a lot clearer if you're either clipping, masking or reordering your layers. As you can see when I move this curve outside my ellipse layer here. There are a few other things I'll talk about throughout this session, but now let's take a look at the shape builder tool. This feature has been frequently requested and we really wanted to make sure our version of it was particularly effective and user friendly to work with. So first of all, let's look at this guitar design I have here. The finished illustration on the right was created using these simple shapes you can see on my artboard to the left, and I'll show you how this was put together. If we first of all locate the Shape Builder tool from the tools panel on the left, or we can use the keyboard shortcut of S to get to the tool more quickly. We can then go ahead and select all of the layers we want to interact with, and take a look at the context toolbar to see the options we have available to us. As you might expect, you can add, take away, and create new shapes with this tool. And by default, these options are all deselected. This allows you to make your shape selection first or make multiple shape selections and then decide from one of the options. And as I approach the shapes with my cursor, we have these visual indicators showing us which shapes we can interact with. So I'll select these overlapping areas here on the left and these selections on the right too. Then I can go and select delete to remove those shapes from my design. With the main body of the guitar, I'm going to change this to add beforehand. And now every time I let go of the mouse button, we can create our shapes rapidly one after the other. This is no doubt a great way to work when you're experimenting with designs or if you're used to using a tool like this, and it can really speed up your workflow being able to quickly create shapes in this way. And when you look at the finished design again, you can easily see how by retaking these steps and adding some additional flourishes and elements, you can create something interesting really very quickly and easily. In the next example I have here, I want to introduce the idea of creating gaps with the shape builder. You can see how I've simply taken two ellipses, then duplicated them on top of each other, making sure that the ones at the bottom of the layer stack are a bit bolder than the ones on top. Now what we can do this time is try a different drag method instead. So I'll change to line, and I'll also make sure that we have these extra settings enabled too. So I'll keep both clean up unused curves and clean up unused areas enabled. Now when I go to make my selection, I can easily highlight the areas I need with one smooth motion. And once I release the mouse, I've converted these four shapes into one single curve, with my intended gaps helping me to create this traditional infinite loop symbol. Alternatively, if I undo these steps, I could also use the third option to create a new shape with the selected areas. This has kept my original ellipses intact, allowing me to go back and try different variations if that was something I needed to do. And I can just turn those other layers off to give us the finished result. The last example I wanted to show you is a way to combine a few of the methods we've just looked at. Here I have something similar to my infinite loop, but I'm going to create a more complex, interwoven, knotted design. So again, I'll make sure I have the shape tool selected, and I'll select all of my ellipses, then this time I want to make sure the add option is deselected. And I also want to switch back to freehand so I can select along the curves of the shapes and make sure I have the other options enabled as well. Now I can go ahead and start to select the various parts of the design I want to keep. You'll notice that there's a particular way to achieve this knotted look we're after, which involves making sure we select an even number of segments each time to help keep the design looking even and symmetrical once we get to the end. So once we have everything selected, we can go ahead and select add. And just like that, we've created our new interwoven knotted design. A couple of extra steps I'd like to take are to just separate the shape into different layers for further flexibility. 
So with the shape selected with the Move tool, I'll go to our Boolean options in the toolbar and choose Divide. As shown in the Layers panel, this has broken up our shape into multiple separate layers. Now holding Shift to create multiple selections, I can use Command G on Mac or Control G on Windows to group these, leaving me with four individual groups. And I'll give each one its own new colour via the colour panel. And there we go. So that was just a brief introduction into some of the ways you might use this brand new Shape Builder tool. One of the new features which we're most excited about with Designer version 2 is the new Vector Warp feature. It's a really powerful new tool and allows you to non-destructively warp or distort your vector curves or text elements within your design and we have a range of presets with this feature as well. So let's look at how that works with this design. I'm going to start off with this group of thin rectangles I've organised together inside this ellipse and show you how you can instantly start to warp these using a new warp group. Once you have the correct layer selected and click on the new icon we have here which will show you some presets we can choose from, each of which has its own use cases and individual benefits. Alternatively, you can head over to Layer and Warp Group, or use the handy keyboard shortcut Option Command G on Mac or Alt Control G on Windows. This shortcut also creates a mesh group by default, but you can easily change this to any of the other presets by referring to the context toolbar. Now we can make our selection from the drop down box, reset our current warp or change some of the other options which I'll mention in a moment. Let's start by simply interacting with these handles and nodes we have over the top of our design. You can see how quickly I can start to manipulate the lines to create something more interesting, but also how smoothly the lines are being displayed while I'm doing it. The lines will start to bunch together in a really complex way as we gradually make them more and more distorted, but it just again highlights how smooth it is when you're actually doing this kind of function. This is looking quite nicely warped now, but I want to compare it to my previous simple line setup, which we can do by utilising the mute mesh option we have in the context toolbar. This is a great way to go back and make changes to the layout without your warp being applied, and can be really handy when comparing designs in a before and after type of situation. And a key thing to mention here is the fact that we don't need to flatten or convert our warps into curves unless we actually choose to. So at this stage, we can easily just go back and forth with our unwarped version in a truly non-destructive way, which is especially useful when you're experimenting during the design process. I'm quite happy with how this is looking for now though, so let's move on to our lettering examples. I have this simple warped text here, so let's see if we can make this a bit more fitting. This time, I'm going to choose quad instead of the default mesh, and then start to mess around with the text. As we interact with the corner nodes and the rest of the boundaries, you can see that where the mesh option was focusing more on the internal area, Quad is letting us warp the overall shape instead. However, we can also add additional warp targets by simply clicking on the outer path, which gives us more nodes and handles to work with, allowing us to have more control over the design. If we click in one of the empty spaces, we can also then move whole segments around at a time, or by clicking again, we can create even more warp targets so it really is hugely flexible and lets you work in your own preferred way. I'm happy with how this has turned out though, so I'll show you the next section I want to apply a similar effect to. This time, if we use one of the other presets from the list, we can see our design transform instantly. For example, if we use fisheye and then change the value to a much lower amount in the context toolbar, we get this great depth effect. But the one I want to use this time is twist, which I think is a particularly effective preset. Now, when we change the value percentage, the middle section is twisting either to the left or right. And once I have a rough placement that I like, I can go in further and tweak the handles to suit my preference. This is a good time to show you that changing the junction handles from smooth to sharp can also really help to give a more exaggerated effect. So it's worth experimenting with all of these settings to see what works best for you. Now we have our two text elements, I'm going to copy them onto the first cover design I was working on. I'll use V for the Move tool and Command-C on Mac or Control-C on Windows to copy. Then Command-V on Mac, Control-V on Windows to paste. 
And I'll just resize these to fit into my artboard as well. So now that's looking ready to go, I'm going to copy this whole design over to this last example I have on the right hand side. So here I've put together an advert for this vinyl cover we've just been working on, but we'll need to use the perspective warp feature to get it to sit properly in our mock-up. So with my artwork layer selected and roughly in place, and I'll use the keyboard shortcut this time again, I can go ahead and add my warp group and select perspective. This works in a similar way to using quad, but it allows us to create more depth with our warps to help us make this vinyl cover sit more realistically in the image. So by moving the nodes, we can simply position them in the four corners of the vinyl cover and the warp group will display in a way that works best. And one last touch is I'd like to use the transparency tool just to fade the right hand corner of the design and try and help give the illusion that it's actually in place on the vinyl cover. So there we have our finished design and it's worth highlighting the fact that we've used a perspective warp on top of a layer that actually contained three other warp groups and it just shows you how powerful this tool really is and it's really worth experimenting with adding multiple warps to help you get some really interesting effects. If you use DWG or DXF CAD files in your design work you'll be pleased to know that you can now import and edit these files inside Affinity Designer version 2. There are a few ways we can use DWG or DXF files in Designer and one of the quickest ways is to drag your file directly into the information panel at the top of the document window. And however we choose to place these files, we will always be shown this import dialog box to help us import with the correct settings. Here we can decide which CAD layout we want to work with. Depending on the contents of the file itself, we can choose a different DPI, change the background colour and override the line colour as well. We can also select some of these handy other settings such as apply a drawing scale, remove unwanted hidden items and fit model to page. Personally I feel as though override line weights is one of the most beneficial options when working with these files in Designer as this changes all of the vector line work to a 0.1 point stroke width which helps to avoid any issues when importing particularly complicated CAD files and I find this much easier to work with. So I'll just hit OK and here we have our imported DWG. If we take a look at the layers panel, all of our line work, vector curves, text elements and layer groups have all been imported and we can easily go ahead and make any adjustments to the design itself. So if I select one of these circular curves in the centre here, I could then use my stroke settings and increase the line width substantially or simply make any other changes to the overall design itself. So as you can see we have complete freedom here to do whatever we might need to do with this file directly within Designer itself. Another option I wanted to show you though was by placing the file into a document instead. So I use the shortcut Command N on Mac or Control N on Windows to create a new document. I'll choose A3, change this to Landscape and I'll go ahead and turn my margins off as well. And notice we can also control our image placement policy here to either be Prefer Embedded or prefer linked and we can then click create. So this time I'm going to use the place image tool found in the tools panel on the left and I'll quickly locate my file and then once again we're given the same options as before. So I'll click OK and I can now place the file in the correct area and dimensions that I need for this paper size. I'll also use my alignment tools in the context toolbar to centralize the file perfectly in the middle of the canvas. And while we're in the context toolbar, this is a great chance to talk you through the various options we have here. We can adjust the scale, change the page box that we have set, or we can utilize one of the newer features we've brought into version two of the apps, which is this layer visibility setting. Here I can choose which layers are hidden and which ones are visible at any given time. This feature has a lot of benefits in quite a few different scenarios, and it's particularly useful when you need to make a quick change to what is being shown on screen without having to go back and re-export the original file. And it's also worth highlighting that this feature works with any layered affinity file or PDF which you have placed in your document. So there are plenty of ways to take advantage of it. But if I head over to window and then show you our resource manager, here you can see how our DWG file has been placed. We can see this has correctly been brought in as an embedded file. But we also have the option to make this a linked file instead. 
This is another really useful option when working with a team of people or if you are expecting some changes to be made to this file at a later date. But by keeping this as embedded, it allows us to edit the file directly within Designer instead, just as we did before. So I'll just click close and move on to the next section. With this particular example, I'd like to turn off the text layers I have in this file and I'd like to make another adjustment as well. We can do this by either clicking on the Edit Document button or by double clicking the layer thumbnail. And we can see that we now have the same setup we had before. So if I zoom in and select one of these text layers, I can now head over to Select Same and choose Name. Or I could have gone with Select Object and Art Text too. This has selected all of these matching layers, and to make life easier in the future, I'm going to also give these layers a colour tag as well. So I'll simply right click on one of the layers and give them a yellow colour tag, and then make these layers hidden. Next, I want to just select this hatch area in the middle and bring it to the top of the layer stack with Command Shift Square Bracket on Mac or Control Shift Square Bracket on Windows, just to make this easier to locate in the future. I'll also turn this layer off as well. Now we can either close this embedded document or keep it open, but you'll notice when we head back to our main design, those changes have been made and we can move on to the next step. And this is just another useful workflow suggestion I wanted to show you when using these types of files, but it can be used in a few different scenarios as well. So if we switch over to the pixel persona and then this time grab the flood fill tool, I'm going to now use this to highlight certain areas of the design in a really quick and easy way. Let's add a new pixel layer first and then we need to make sure the source setting is set to layers beneath, which is a really important step to make sure we're selecting from the correct areas. This is also a great chance for me to show you the new anti-alias setting we've included in version two as well. I would recommend using this setting in these types of scenarios, as you'll usually find that it gives you a cleaner fill area closer to the boundaries that you're selecting from. So it's definitely something you should try out for yourself. Now, if I choose a color from the color panel, I can start to fill these areas that I want to highlight. Notice how quickly it fills to the selected boundary from the CAD file. And another thing I like to do in this scenario is to create a new pixel layer for each of the sections I want to fill. So I'll make a new layer for these outer areas and continue to fill these accordingly. And the benefit of having separate pixel layers is that I can easily go back and change the color I've filled with by using our layer effects or via the quick effects panel. And I'll do this by using a color overlay. I'll also just place these underneath our CAD file layer by holding Shift to multi-select too. And then for the last steps, I'm going to go back into my embedded file and turn the hatch layer back on. And I'll scroll down and use the select same tag color option to locate and turn on all of our text layers again too. And if we head back to our original document, we can see those changes are back in. And one of the major benefits to this workflow is that our color highlights and pixel layers are completely separated from our embedded or linked CAD file. So if this DWG file had some minor changes made to it externally and was then placed back into our file, all of our color work and other tweaks made in Designer would remain intact and we can carry on working on the new file without any disruptions at all. So hopefully you can see from this workflow example just how flexible the new DWG and DXF file integration really is and potentially it might give you some ideas about how you could use this feature yourself too. The new knife and scissor feature is a much requested tool which we're really happy to include in version two of Designer. It allows you to slice and chop into your vector elements with ease. So let's have a look at how that works here. With this design, I want to make my top text elements a little more dynamic and I want to continue the design we've started with this section on the right here too. So the first thing we need to do is locate the knife tool from our tools panel on the left or with the keyboard shortcut K. With this tool enabled, we can tap on the vector layer itself to select a particular object and we can combine that with shift to make multiple selections too. So if I select this top section of text, we can then take a look at the context toolbar to see the options we have available to us. The stabilizer is a huge plus with this tool as it really helps you to create smooth cuts and slices, but for now I'm going to deselect it and come back to this later on. As with this design, I need my lines to be perfectly straight when they're cutting through the lettering, so I'm going to use the keyboard modifiers we have to help me achieve this. So by dragging and holding shift, we can keep our line to a 45 or 90 degree angle. However, I need to be a bit more precise with how we cut into it. So this time, by holding control on the keyboard, this allows me to lock my starting point 
and then move the mouse around to choose the angle and positioning of the rest of my cut line. Now I'll make my first cut and slice straight through all of our letters. Notice that we started out with an editable text layer, and then by creating our knife cut, our text is converted into curves and conveniently put into one single group layer. This is quite handy as it avoids us having to make these steps ourselves and helps us to keep our newly cut shapes nicely organised. Next I'd like to select the lower part of the lettering which I can easily do with the knife tool still enabled and I can use shift to select the new sections I want as well. Now I'll slice through this one more time and then I'll just switch over to the node tool to select the new sections I've made and group them all together into three parts. And I'll use command G on Mac or control G on Windows to do this. This means I can now go ahead and apply some layer effects to each group, just to help add some more depth to each of our sections. So I'll use the layer effects icon in the layers panel, and I'll add some outer shadow here and adjust my settings accordingly. And as you can see, I'll need to raise this layer to the top of my group as well, just to make sure our shadow is appearing as intended. And now once I'm happy with how this looks, I can use one of our new additions in version two and click and drag on the layer effects icon itself, which will allow me to copy these same settings to each of my groups below, which is just another little improvement we've made to the layers panel and one thing I definitely find myself using quite a bit. And I'll just switch back to the move tool with V and reposition these groups to help make that outer shadow be more effective. Now we're done with the top part of the design, I'm just going to quickly show you how we can take similar steps to create these shattered elements we have on the right part of the design. And this time I'm going to enable the stabilizer setting in our context toolbar. This has two different options here as well. Personally, I prefer to use the rope setting as this gives you a predetermined stabilizer length, but you might prefer to use the window option, which acts in more of an elasticated way, which can be quite useful at times too. If you haven't used the stabilizer before, it's something you can also combine with any pencil or brush tool work as well. So it really is a useful addition in the apps. So with this new setting enabled, I can simply approach this letter here. I can then drag in to make my first cut and use the extra rope length we have with this setting to pull back and help us create this triangular shape. I'll just do a few more of these to give you an idea of the effect even more. Then I'll switch to the move tool again and reposition these new segments in the same way we have with the other shattered parts of the design. So it really is quick and easy to create this kind of effect, especially when using the stabilizer mode as well. If I switch over to this other design I have here, I'll show you a quick example of how you might use the scissor function with this tool too. So with this branding example I have here, all of these curve layers are still editable. So one thing we might do in this scenario is with the knife tool selected, we can hover over one of the lines and we can then use the scissor icon to instantly cut this line down the middle. And using this method has saved us a handful of steps we would usually have to take if we were just using the node tool and the context toolbar, which is a really great time saving bonus. So now I can press command on Mac or control on Windows to access the node tool and easily reposition both of these lines into a new part of the design. And then lastly, I just wanted to show you this final example using a similar process to our first section, but instead of cutting into one curve, I'm going to use the 17 ellipse layers I have selected. So I'll enable the knife tool with the keyboard shortcut this time. Then with the stabilizer enabled, I'll click and drag to take a chunk out of our vinyl design. And then now we've instantly sliced through all 17 of our layers and we're left with this new section, which we can interact with again. And using the move tool, I'll make a marquee selection and just loosely move them into my desired location. Which just shows how powerful this new feature is, especially when you're working with multiple layers like we are in this example. So hopefully it's another tool which you'll enjoy using as well. The new area and measure tools in Affinity Designer version two allow you to work more effectively with scale in your document. They also allow you to measure certain areas and boundaries of your vector elements in your design work as well. But let's look at this particular example I have here. This document I'm working on is for a potential mural design I want to put together. I've created a gridded area using our new quick grid feature, which I'll talk about later on using evenly sized squares to fill the space. This is a method often used when creating large scale designs like this. So it's possibly something I might add to the wall itself to help me transfer the digital design one square at a time 
onto the relevant space on the wall. The current issue is I only have the height of the wall and none of the other measurements which I would need. So we'll use the measure, area and scale features to help me put this together. Firstly, I'm going to grab the measure tool, then I'm going to click and drag along this line I have on the edge too. And as I move around with this tool, you can see we have a small info box, which tells us which area we're about to measure from, or which area we're interacting with. Currently, this is listing the default measurement I have in this document, but if we head over to the context toolbar, we can set this to our own specific scale. So I'll click Assign Drawing Scale, and as I know this wall is 3 meters tall, I'll enter 3M and click Apply. Now we can see this has changed our previous measurement line to display our new distance. So now what we can do is switch over to the Area tool, which we can access by long pressing on the Measurement Tool icon. And as we hover over our gridded area, we're given this useful information on the screen at the same time. And on top of that, I can click into the grid I made and select a few of the squares at once. This is really handy if you need to work out the total area of a particularly awkward shape, or if you just need to measure a specific portion of your overall area. In this case though, I'd like to work out the total width of the mural. And because we have our scale settings in place, I can select the rectangle I have, which covers the entire area. Then we can refer to the context toolbar or the small information bar above our cursor. In this case, I'll need to change our perimeter mode from full edges to custom segments instead, which then allows me to choose just the top line, which is displaying a 5.5 meter length. So I'll switch to the move tool with V, and I'll use option click and drag on Mac or alt click and drag on Windows to copy my side text to the top of my screen and enter the new amount as well. I'll then take the same steps as before to measure one of the individual squares. And I'll copy the text again, as this will help me to make sure I create my gridded squares to the correct size on the wall itself. Then finally, I'd like to take a measurement of the overall mural area, as this will give me an accurate area of how much paint might be required to complete a mural design of this size. So I'll click on my top rectangle layer again and check with the readout I'm given in the context toolbar. So I'll go ahead and copy this side text in the same way as before and enter the new amount. And now we're good to go. So that was just one example of a particular use case, but these tools can be put to great work in many other scenarios, such as architectural and interior planning, product design, and lots of others. So hopefully this just gives you a quick example of how you might be able to use these tools yourself. The new quick grid feature allows you to instantly create your own gridded area using the shape tools or the frame text tool. And it allows you to speed up your workflow in particular design use cases. So I'll show you one way I like to use it myself here. I'm just going to start off with this blank A4 document I've put together. Then I'll grab the rectangle tool from the tools panel to begin making our quick grid. I'll also make sure snapping is enabled, as this will help quite a lot with this process. If you click and drag to create your first shape and then introduce the arrow keys, you can instantly start to create duplicates of your shape. And as you change the size of your shape with the mouse, all the additional shapes will do the same. We can also hold down the arrow keys for a little bit longer to create distance between our duplicated shapes. And the other keyboard modifiers we have are also worth experimenting with to help you get the result you're looking for. But with this example, I want to create a quick mood board with some images I've put together. So I'm just going to create six rectangular shapes without any gaps this time. And because I have snapping enabled, I can make sure I'm snapping to my boundaries. But if you need to adjust afterwards, this is also easily doable. So next I'm going to introduce my images into these frames by dragging them straight into my document from my file browser. And to utilize the place image function, we need to hold Option on Mac or Alt on Windows when we drag these in to bring up the Place Images panel. Now we can go ahead and select the image we want to put in first. I'll also select the rectangle I want to clip it into, and the important step here is to use this Insert Inside the Selection option found in the toolbar. Then I can either click and drag to place the image at a specific size, or single click to place at the original size of the image. So I'll keep repeating these steps until I've filled up my whole page with my images.
Now this is looking good already, but there are a few other steps I want to take. I'll use Command on Mac or Control on Windows to directly select my placed images which are inside the frames I've made. And then I can just quickly resize and adjust them to get more of my image in the frame. And if I now make sure all of the frames are selected, I'm going to press D on the keyboard to reset my colour values to our defaults, which has changed our light grey fill to a white one instead. And I can see that I also have a black stroke applied to these rectangles. So if I use Shift and X on the keyboard, that will switch these round. And I can also press X again to change the focus back to the strokes. Now, using one of the handy keyboard shortcuts we've added, I can use the square brackets to instantly increase my stroke settings. And I can create a white border around my images, all without having to use the mouse or approach any of our separate panels. So it's a great way to make these adjustments completely on the fly. Finally, with everything selected, I'll resize the frame slightly to give a little more space around the edges, while also holding Shift and Command on Mac or Shift and Control on Windows to keep my proportions intact and resize from the centre. So there we have a brief example of how you might use this new quick grid feature, but there are many other ways you might utilise it in your work, so I really encourage you to try it out for yourself. We've also added a new style picker tool. Now this works in a similar way to the colour picker, but this time allows you to copy and paste certain attributes and effects just using this tool. And we've also added some improvements to the layer effects as well. So let's look at this example I have here. I'd like to make some changes to this design and the quickest way for me to make these is with the new style picker feature itself. To access this new tool, I just need to long press on the color picker and now we can select the style picker instead. The first thing you might notice with this tool is that by referring to the context toolbar, we're given many different options of what we might want to copy and paste without having to simply copy across everything at once. And we've included some quite specific options here, like layer opacity, character and paragraph settings, and general object settings too. So there really are quite a few ways you can make the most of these options. But with this first example, I'd like to change the colour of this text we have here. I could use the colour picker for a simple change like this, but instead if I change the options at the top to fill only, we can achieve the same result with just one tool, which means I can carry on trying other options throughout my document without having to change to a different tool every time. So first of all, I'm going to select my text using Shift to multi-select, and I'll try this white section we have at the top. That looks okay, but instead, I think I'd like to try resetting these values and go with a different option. So I'll try selecting from this robot design instead. And I can do that by holding Option on Mac or Alt on Windows to make my new style selection. And this time, we're picking from an object with a layer effects applied to it. So if we refer to our layers panel, we can see this has been copied across to each line of our text, which is a really quick way to copy that layer effects over multiple items. I can also use this tool to reapply other design elements too. So in this case, let's change the dashed line we have here to the one I've used to surround the X on the right. I'll use the same method again. And in this case, I think I'll actually go with the other line I have on the opposite side. And this way I can make sure these two lines are consistent with each other. And now I think I'd like to change this text section we have in the middle. So first I'll make sure I have that selected using V to access the move tool. And again I'll shift select to locate all of the text. I'll now grab the style picker again. And now I'll apply a gradient based on the fill I have at the very back of my document. Notice that this time instead of the layer effects we copied earlier, this has just given each of our letters the same gradient setting. And we can easily change this by using the fill tool. And if I click and drag, we can apply the gradient settings to the group of letters as a whole. And then lastly, I'd like to reformat the text we have in the circle here. So this time, I'm going to make sure I have nothing selected beforehand using Command D on Mac or Control D on Windows to deselect. And I'll select the style picker tool again. And I'll pick from the same background as before. And then this time, when we approach the text we have here, we can apply it to whole words at a time with a single click, or we can click and drag to apply it to individual letters, which is really handy and allows you to be very specific with what you're applying your style to. This colour is now a little too faint against the white circle, so now with the style picker again, I'll select the colour from this X on the side, and single click to load that into the circle at the back. And as you can see from this short run through, there are a huge amount of uses and benefits to this new tool. 
So it's definitely another one I'm sure you'll find yourself using in your own particular workflow as well. So that basically concludes this run through of some of the new features we've added to version two of Affinity Designer. If you wanted to watch more videos like this, we have a huge selection on our YouTube channel and on our website. But other than that, thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.